and welcome to Pharma Forum. We are at Reuters in Europe. Once again, we are back in Barcelona. Uh, I'm here with Peter Steinico, who is the global head of biosimilars and country president for Sandoz Austria. Hello, Peter. How are you? Hello. I'm good. Thank you, Liz. Are you enjoying what you've seen so far? Yes. I, I just actually came here a couple of hours ago, so I'm looking forward to the day. And you're set to go on stage later on today That's as right. part of a panel on strengthening health equity and initiatives across your access team. So if we talk a little bit about what the gaps or barriers to, to ensuring equitable access are at the moment. Yes, sure. Look, um, we are working in the space of, of biosimilars and biosimilars are basically the follow on um, uh, of biologics that have come to market. So whenever a biologic loses patent expiry, um, we try to bring a biosimilar to market. And um, biosimilars are important because they are usually great competition. And by creating competition, um, HCPs and healthcare systems have a choice. And what we see today is that while 85% of the world's population live in low and middle income countries, 80% um, of biologics are being used in high income countries. So there is still not a health equity uh, when it comes to the biologics and, and biosimilars. And, and reasons for that is, um, is, is, is um, different ones. There's um, certainly infrastructure, um, there's um, education um, of um, HCPs of the whole healthcare systems, there's regulatory pathways, there's costs, so there's a plethora of, um, of reasons why it's, it's not happening. But I think we've made quite big progress over the last decade or so. And we're only going to make more progress as more biosimilars come onto the market if we think about the fact that we're still quite early on into the process. So surely that's going to have an impact on, on health equity if there's more competition then there's going to be more yeah. affordability options. That's right. Um, I mean, if you, look at, um, if you look ahead over the next 10 years or so, there will be um, roughly 150 pattern expiries of biologics, um, so that offers, again, a big opportunity for more affordable biosimilars. But also, if you look back over the last um, um, uh, 10 years, 50 billion of dollars have been saved in Europe alone, just thanks to the introduction of biosimilars, another 25 um, billion or so in the US. And that's projected to grow to 270 billion um, by 2027. So there's a huge potential to save on one hand side um, on existing drugs, which then gives really leeway to introduce innovation again, which again helps patients um, for treating 50, new diseases. 50 billion, 50 is billion yes. such a, an unimaginable number, apart from in the pharma industry. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to give too much away from what you're going to talk about later on today. I want to save some for the stage. But can you describe a little bit about the strategy for incorporating health equity, um, talking about into design and execution principles? Yeah, look, um, health equity for us is, is important. Our, our, our purpose as a company is really um, pioneering access for patients. So not just for, uh, for biosimilars, but also for, for generics. We are in the off-patent um, um, arena. And when it comes for biosimilars, what we um, just recently have done, we have um, brought to life an initiative called Act for Biosimilars. This is a multidisciplinary uh, initiative where we have um, a, an advisory board uh, with um, HCPs, with patient advocacy leaders, with biosimilar experts um, and, and, and industry experts. And the aim is really to, at the end of the day, to democratize biologics. What we want to ha achieve is 30% um, more, uh, or 30 um, usage of biosimilars um, in, in 30 countries of this world by 2030. Mm -hmm. And um, we look at, act for biosimilars means we, we look at the four A's, which is access, um, approvability, affordability, and um, acceptability. So what is really important is, first of all, that you get access. Mm -hmm. that, um, and that's for health equity important, that, that, that patients across the world have access to, um, to biologics. And then what's also important is um, that it's accepted. So we need to do a lot of ed education of, of HCPs so that they really understand the concept of biosimilars. They understand that biosimilars have the same um, safety efficacy um, as, a, a, as a biologic. And then, of course, it gets more affordable. Um, and then you can adapt and, and hopefully there's more health equity. I'm, I'm thinking back to what we heard on stage earlier this morning from a gentleman from Microsoft who said that uh, a lack of knowledge leads to fear and 
the fear of using a, a biologic or, or talking to your patient about a biologic if you don't understand it, and then your patient being able to explain to, to the person who's coming to you why this is beneficial for them. So I'm really interested in the idea of, of education in that sense, but how do you get everybody speaking the same language on, on <laughs> when it comes to that? Because we, patients have a completely different yeah. set, of, a set of language rules for approaching their, their treatment than HCPs do. So how do you get everybody sort of on the same page? Um, I think it takes, first of all, a, a lot of effort and, and, um, and skills, of course, in order to really understand what's, what's driving um, an HCP uh, in making his choice. Mm -hmm. what's, but also then understanding the patient. So what, what does a patient uh, really want? And when we introduced the first biosimilar, which is back in 2006, um, this was a human growth hormone, which we still have on market, right? It was really, fear was the dominant word. I think you, you mentioned it before, right? There was a lot of um, uncertainty, a lot of um, unknowns um, in the, in, in, in the um, among HCPs, among patients and so forth. So how to overcome the, that fear was, um, of course we had a lot of programs, a, a lot of educational programs, but at the same time, it just takes time. It takes experience, it takes um, the evidence, the medical evidence, and I think we have generated, um, as an industry now, more than five billion patient days on biosimilars. So if you look at across the globe, since the first introduction of biosimilar to today, there's more than five billion patient days. So a, day, a, a patient has been on, on a biosimilar, with of course a lot of data, right? And all that data suggests that it is, has the same safety, efficacy, and quality as the biologic, and that overcomes your fear. That's eight years. In no, eight it, it's since 2006, so it's oh, 2006. Se se I'm thinking years. 16. So no, six, six, <laughs> that's yeah. still impressive. It is, it is. Yeah. So what role do you see access play teams playing? We've spoken about access teams a little bit later. Can you explain their role in, in helping to drive health equity as well? Yeah, access teams are important um, um, for us because for, uh, I mean, the biosimilar industry is, is a different one than the, the innovator industry, right? Mm -hmm. In the innovator industry, you have to go out and, and really launch a new product that hasn't existed before. So you really have to think, okay, what's actually the value for, uh, for a patient, the value for a healthcare system? When a biosimilar comes, it's fairly easy, right? I mean, you have the originator. Mm -hmm. And as an access team, you think about, okay, how much, um, what's a, a good proposition in order to provide broader access? Um, and, and there are, in many jurisdictions of this world, there's there's clear rules on, on where a price similar would be priced, um, how the price points are and so forth. So it, it's a very different work the access teams are doing. The aim is really to um, educate again the system that price should not be the only factor when you decide about a biosimilar, right? There, there should be other factors like um, ESG criteria, but also um, looking at the device, looking at how, um, how services uh, um, are being served for patients and so forth. That's really interesting that it's, it's looking at it from more of a holistic angle mm. than a solely a price angle. Um, can you share an example of, of an initiative that has been successful in this area? Um, look, there is, uh, in, in, in different countries of, of Europe, um, especially in the, in the Nordic countries, typically drugs are being procured via tenders. Mm -hmm. um, take the example of Denmark that already early on it was, I think, 2010 or so, when, um, when they were uh, procuring the human growth hormone again, they, they uh, issued a tender, invited all the different companies that had a, a human growth hormone in, in their portfolio. And there, again, they did not look only at price. What was important for them was really um, other criteria like how, how is your device working? And because the growth hormone basically you, it is, is mainly to treat children, I mean also adults, but it's, it's mainly for children. And the children, they need to um, inject that, the human growth hormone on a daily basis. So every day they, they get a, basically uh, with the pen, they inject uh, the, the daily dose of the growth hormone. Mm -hmm. So what is key really is that um, the children, they adhere to this daily injection. Yeah. They are not having fear and uh, they have confidence in, in, in that device. So they, they, they attend the authorities, they looked very thoroughly on what is the best device, what quality criteria or, or what features that device should have in order to be, in order to achieve a good adherence of, of that population, of that patient population. And price was also important because of course you need savings, but again, adherence is 
is also important because that also generates um, costs or, or not. And is adherence just one of the ways that you measure whether or not an initiative has been successful or not? What are the, how do you measure over time the outcomes of trying to get more patients access and, and equitable uh, access to? I mean, adherence is certainly one and, and, and that's important. But um, at the end of the day, I think what, what's also key is that with a new device, you can also change the way how how uh, patients look at look at the treatment. I, I think it's it's a, a different opportunity. It's in, in, and we come usually with an innovative um, um, device design because we we come to market with a new product, whereas the original that has been there for 10, 15 years. And at the end of the day, what you measure with uh, how, how you can measure the success is also when you look at the market share. It's as simple as that, right? You, you want to ha you want to treat as many patients as possible, and that's also measured by your your your, your market share and, and your financial results. I think it's really interesting to hear you say it's the way that the patient views the product as well, because if patient, if, as you say, if, if children are too scared to to mm. have an injection every day, then they're not going to want to stick with the product long term. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about talking to patient groups earlier, but I'd like to hear a little more about how you involve patients in this process of, of helping to get them the treatments that they need. Because yeah. obviously we talk a lot about patient centricity and the fact that patients should be involved, but how, how are you approaching that? Um, again, there's a, um, probably we're doing, doing it in a different way um, than originator industry because it, it's, it's a different, it's, it's a different um, situation, right? We, we bring a f a basically something to market that already existed uh, once the patent expires. So what we don't need to look at is um, at the drug substance as such, right? We, we are, uh, the biosimilar must have the same efficacy, safety and quality as the originator. What we do look at though is how the patient is getting the drug. And that's, and I always come back to the device because it's really important. Mostly our drugs are in the field of um, um, growth disorders or in immunology, which is also a chronic disease. Um, so for example, rheumatoid arthritic patients, um, they, uh, they, they, they also get the injections um, very frequently over a very long time. And, and the device is really key because they, they hardly can handle any device um, as, they are, as they have rheumatoid arthritic disorders. So there we work very closely with patients to understand, okay, how should a device look like so that you can handle that, that you can really use it yourself rather than a nurse um, coming to you. And, um, and that's where we have these patient-centric teams in the device development. Um, speaking to patients. And then, once launched, we also think about, okay, what are the patient services? So how can we support uh, the patients in their, in their daily routines? Um, what do they need in terms of online services or, or offline services? And that's where the patient comes very importantly into play. And I have two more questions for you. Sure. Uh, first one is, when we talk about health equity and, and access, who do you think has the most influence when it comes to driving new initiatives? You mean in, in the... In the industry as a whole, who, who are the people leading the charge, essentially? Um, is it policy makers? Is it regulators? Is it pharma companies? I think it's all of them together. It doesn't work if, if, there's, um, if you rely just on one party. Um, we see it as our uh, goal and, and, and our mission as well to engage with policy makers, to engage with regulators in order to achieve better health equity, but it cannot be just ourselves. It cannot be just ours by ourselves, I mean the industry, right? Um, it cannot be just the regulator. It cannot be just the, um, th there need to be a joint objective, a joint goal and a joint wish. Um, sometimes it's, it's the industry leading the charge. Sometimes you see it from, from different uh, um, other stakeholders, but I think at the end of the day, it's, it's a multidisciplinary game where everyone can contribute a lot. It comes back to the idea that, that Reuters opened with, which was the idea of rowing and yeah. all pulling together as a team. Exactly. Uh, and my final question for you today, we talked a little bit about challenges and where we're going at the moment. Where do you see opportunities coming for, for helping to improve equity and, and health access? Look, I, I mentioned before this um, 50 billion that we saved in Europe alone and 25 um, that we saved in the US. I think there's a huge opportunity ahead of us um, in, in that industry on, on two fronts. One, again, 
saving costs and providing earlier access, earlier and broader access by introducing more biosimilars. Mm -hmm. So by really streamlining the pathway, the regulatory pathway that biosimilars get um, faster to market and get to market at all, because there will be also situations where biologics are not having a biosimilar. So get them to market and, and by that generate again cost savings in order to fuel, um, fuel innovation. And I think we are just at the, at the beginning of something which is much, much bigger in, in, in 10 years from now, but we need to get it right. So streamline regulatory, um, make uh, the, 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 the economics um, work, right? And, and not just look at price when you procure uh, those drugs, but also look at, at other criteria, and I'm sure there will be um, much better health equity, not just in, in, in Europe, the US, but also in low and middle income countries where probably we see the biggest potential. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining me thank today. You, uh, thank you for watching and check out our other videos coming from Pharma Forum soon. Thank you very much.